The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I am Shannon Penrod. I'm just reminding myself and we are webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. It is Friday. It is the last day of May. There are a couple of things that I want to remind you before I do anything else. And the first thing, the most important thing, because it has to do with today, is that there has been a sale going on for the skills program. And if you watch the show, you know we talk about skills. I have an IEP coming up a little bit later on today. And can I tell you how much I'm still a little scattered because, you know, it's still IEP, but I am not a crazy person that I normally am. I'm able to be here, let's put it that way, because I was able to use the skills program. And there are so many other things you can use skills for, but I, man, right now at this point in my life, I love the IEP prep uh, aspects of it, but also having access to that curriculum to be able to teach your kids, it's invaluable. It's a great, great tool. And it, when you have access to skills, it's by a monthly subscription that you can start and stop whenever you want. But there's been a sale going on that it's 20% off. And not just 20% off for this month, but 20% off for the life of the prescription prescription. Well, that's kind of what it is, is a prescription. A subscription is what we actually call it though. Um, so uh, that's the word. So 20% off a lifetime of your subscription. And so if you're thinking about getting skills, if you're even thinking, thinking about it, today's the day to do it because tomorrow the sale will be over. And then, you know, when I think about the money that you could save yourself, it's absolutely amazing. 20% off the lifetime of the subscription. Uh, okay. So that's really important that I make sure that you know about that. There's also some really important information. If you are in the state of California or even if you're someone who cares about the state of California and autism in the state of California, I want to encourage you to look at our Facebook page right now. Yesterday, I posted a link. Uh, there is some really scary legislation that is uh, trying to be pushed through. I don't know whether it's they think that we're asleep at the wheel, but we are not. As autism community members, we are not asleep at the wheel. And thank heavens to Shelley Hendricks at Autism Votes for bringing this to all of our attention. But they are trying to pass a bill. We have the regional center here in California, and it covered all of my son's ABA therapy. Woohoo for the regional center, right? And then we got insurance reform, and the current status is that if you have insurance, insurance needs to pay first. If you don't have insurance, then the regional center would, will pay. But there's been this gap in between of families who have insurance, but they can't make the copay and they can't do the deductible. It's $5,000 a year for some families. And that's really a hardship for them at this point in the game to come up with that. I can't even imagine. Um, but the regional centers, some of the regional centers around the state have been saying, hey, you know, we used to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for your therapy. We'll be happy to pay for your copay. Uh, but other regional centers weren't doing it. And so a law was being proposed to ask regional centers to automatically pay everybody's copay. And the pushback on it is now is that they're trying to put a law into effect that will mean that no one gets that copay paid and no one will get their deductible. It's going to make it so that many more people are going to have a harder time using their insurance. It won't make it impossible, but for some families it will, uh, depending on what their financial status is. And that 
you know what I like to say, that's a steaming pile of poo. So we're asking your immediate help, and I'm going to remind you of this throughout the show. If you go to our Facebook, uh, click on the link, you can go, you can call, you can email, and even if you're not in the state of California, I know I called yesterday, there's a senator's office and an assemblyman's office, they give you a little script that you can say, and, and I called up and I said it, and they didn't ask me, do you live in the state of California? <laughs> you know, I said, look, I'm an autism mom and don't mess with this. This is not okay. You have no idea what this will be. It will cost you so much more money uh, if you, you know, you, they, what it is is that maybe for a family they'd be paying $5,000 a year, which would enable that child to get maybe $100,000 worth of therapy. And if they don't get that, if they don't spend the $5,000 $5, so that the insurance company spends $100,000, then that we know that that child will end up needing millions of dollars worth of support throughout their lifetime. It's money well spent. It's taxpayer money well spent. You don't need to know that. When you call, you don't have to have those facts. You just call and say, I'm calling about this. I am opposed to it. And then if you want to add something, you can. They also give you a very easy email that you can personalize or not and just send it. Take you 30 seconds. And when I had them on the phone yesterday, they said, we're just writing down hash marks to see and we got a lot of people calling in but they need to hear your voices because if that were to pass it could be catastrophic in California and you know what we always say here if one state gets it done and gets it done right it really has a trickle down for everybody the reason why there are 33 states that have insurance now is because Arizona stepped up and got it done right uh, so don't let California falter there are too many families that need this important. And you might be one in Kansas and you're saying, but I need this here. Yes. Well, if California gets it done and gets it done right, eventually it will trickle down. All right. I feel like I already got on the soapbox today. Uh, this entire show is meant to be interactive. So we encourage your input. Emily's going to show you all the different ways that you can participate with us here. We hope that you will write in, call in, text in, tweet us. Uh, Facebook us, whatever flips your switch, right? But I'm going to remind you that there's only one way to watch us live. That's at www.autism-live.com. When you go there, there's a lovely desktop, a white box. The white box is where you put your cursor, type away, hit enter. It shows up magically right here on our screen. We can ask your question of the experts that we have in the studio. And we're going to have two fabulous experts, two doctors with amazing amount of experience between the two of them that are going to be with us today in the studio and answering your questions. So take advantage of that. It's free. There is no log on. There's no personal information taken. Nobody's talking to you about a credit card. It's not one of those things. Just ask your question. And that's why we're here. I want to remind you that I am not an autism expert. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> I couldn't be further from that. Um, but I'm a mom and I am a passionate mom with an IEP today. Let's say that. <laughs> right? Uh, and I have an interest in you getting hooked up with information that you need. It's so convoluted sometimes on this journey. And I am so privileged when you guys, there are so many of you who have written in and uh, I, I want to be helpful to you in any way that I can. And I, the rules change and the rules are different for every family. And I feel your frustration with you, but we hold hands. We get through this together, right? I said to my husband this morning, si se puede, right? We can do this. Yes, we can. All right. Uh, we like to start every morning with something we fondly refer to as the jargon of the day. This is when we take on one word, one phrase, one acronym, and we try to figure out what this has to do with us and with our children and how we're going to be efficient and effective making the progress that we need to make. And, and if we're working with a child, helping them to make the progress that they need to make. So, our term today is oral 
motor. Uh, and I have a lot of oral motor going on today. So we've been talking about motor skills all this week. Let's talk a little bit about oral motor and why it's important. Let's look at our actual definition, which it's relating to muscles of the mouth and or mouth movements. All right, that's a pretty easy one. And you might think to yourself, I don't really know what that has to do with autism. I don't know what that has to do with my child. Uh, well, our working definition here is the use of the mouth, such as sucking, blowing, chewing, etc. So we get a little bit more specific in terms of how we're going to use these skills. And if you think about all the things that we do using our mouth that, you know, uh, some of it's chewing to make sure that we can swallow, but it also has to do with being able to produce sound and produce it productively. Uh, a little redundant there, but uh, great case in point, we've been watching the A word and here's Jack Riley who has feeding issues. He doesn't like to eat anything that requires a great deal of chewing. When he started therapy, uh, you know, he was very much an applesauce kind of boy. And he, there is some talking that, uh, that was there in the beginning, but a very minimal amount and it wasn't conversational. It wasn't, his language development was behind where it should have been. Uh, Okay, great. But we've got two problems here that uh, seem to be kind of unrelated, but there's going to be some fallout from the one because he has not been chewing on a regular basis. His oral motor did not firm up the way it should be firming up so that when we start to see him requesting things, his ability to make those sounds is a little bit hampered by the fact that the musculature isn't working. And then we have the possibility that you and I don't understand what he's saying. Now, instead of him getting reinforced for having used language and uttered something, we're standing there making him say it again. He's going to get frustrated. We're going to see this child go back to tantruming because he did the thing we asked him to do and he didn't get his reinforcement for it. So we have to make sure that we are up on the, you know, not only making it worthwhile for the child to speak and reinforcing it, but at the same time, getting in there and strengthening those muscles so that when we get the speech, it's much more likely to be understood. It is really important for our kids that we work on this. It can be very frustrating. It can seem tedious. We have to make it fun. Uh, there were so many exercises that they want. I remember one speech pathologist and she was like, okay, well, uh, not the one that we have now, cause now we have a fabulous, fabulous woman. But early on we had somebody who said, okay, well, here's a popsicle stick. And then you're going to stick it in his tongue and you're going to tell him to touch the popsicle stick with his tongue. Now this this is a great exercise to give an 18 year old who is in the theater and, you know, is excited about being a better speaker. Um, but for a three year old who has no receptive language, really, uh, you know, my, my child was not going to do it. Maybe your child would, but we want to make these things fun and we can, uh, and maybe that is fun for a specific child. And maybe, you know, depending on maybe what, maybe it isn't a popsicle stick for some kids, maybe that's a candy stick that, you know, and then they'll touch their tongue to it. I don't know, but um, we need to work on oral motor skills. If there is any kind of a, a difficulty, uh, in, in language and their ability to be understood. And honestly, I think it goes hand in hand with kids who, if there is a feeding issue, uh, it's entirely likely that you want to have it looked at to see whether they're behind oral motor. And it can take a long, long time. We are just now, my son is going to be 10 next week. We are just now at the point where I can work with him productively on tongue twisters and that he finds that a fun thing to do. But you know, when he was three, um, I, I wasn't going to get him to say rubber baby buggy bumpers. Now he thinks it's hilarious. Thank goodness. Cause we're still working on these things because <laughs> you know, it grows with a child. Uh, I always tell that the first day of his life and my very good friend came up to the hospital the first day of his life and held him and said, say oscillating sprinkler. Uh, we know that a, a newborn is not going to say that. And a three-year-old is not going to be able to say that, but we work up to it. Okay. Uh, we always have a question of the day for you. Our question today, what 
then here we are, right hand in hand. What creative ways are you working on oral motor skills? And I can tell you quite honestly, it wasn't until I went into my son's class and we did a bunch of vocal warm ups and tongue twisters with the class that he saw the other kids doing it. And then he, you know, picked his favorites. Like he loves red leather, yellow leather. Um, and there's one that I did with his class that uh, is a theater fun one that has to do with a dragon that he really loves too. Uh, so that, you know, who knew that that was going to be. But one of the things that we have loved doing, if you used to watch that show Minute to Win It, and they have the, the thing where you stick the cookie on the forehead and people have to scrunch their face around to make the cookie uh, move down to their mouth. And so we used to do that and have uh, races, but it was a way of getting him to engage those muscles. But I'd love to hear from you guys what creative ways, how are you making it engaging? Let's trade some thoughts about how we can all be doing this with kids at different skill levels and different age levels. And we'll check in a little bit later on today if we get a moment on Facebook to see what the kinds of things that you guys have written in. We always have a topic of the week. And our topic this entire week, as I mentioned already, has been and continues to be motor skills. As we get into the summer months here and we have the opportunity sometimes to have a little bit more free time or to be flexible with the way in which we're using time, you know, it seems like in a lot of cases, it's very uh, a different kind of structure uh, throughout the winter and spring and fall months. But when we get to summer, we have the opportunity, hopefully, to get outdoors more. It's a great opportunity over the summer to really target the motor skills that are key skills that are building block skills to things that your child might be having a difficulty with. So we talked about visual motor yesterday. Um, and when you stop and think about it, think about the fact that uh, I'm just going to case in point my son, uh, that he still has some social deficits, right? But some of the answers to his social deficits are to be able to play sports with the other boys, but he doesn't have the motor skills to dribble the basketball. So guess what we're going to be doing this summer? Um, and it may seem like, oh, okay, well that's, you know, it's just a motor skill, but it has long range effects. It's going to help him socially on the playground to be, if he's able to play basketball with the other boys boys, it gives him yet another way to engage them other than talking about video games, right? Uh, enough with the Minecraft already. <laughs> so motor skills uh, can be very key, uh, and, and have far reaching effects. So we've been talking about that all this week. Some of the different things that we have going on today, I'm very excited because for the last couple of weeks, we haven't been able to be in the same place at the same time, but we have, uh, today besides a funding tip, we're going to have real progress with Dr. Adele Nadowski. She'll be here in just a few minutes talking with us. And then a little bit later on, we have research with Dr. Jonathan Tarbox who's always a delight. Uh, so both of those are people are amazing professionals in the field of autism. They have just come back from ABAI, ABA International, uh, where I believe that they were both presenting and they are a great resource for all of us. And I want to encourage you to utilize this program to be able to talk with them about the kinds of things that you would like answers about. I will caution you that no one on this show gives child specific advice. That would be a disservice to all of our kids. But there are a lot of things that they can tell you that will really help you on your path to hook you up uh, with the right steps to be the most efficient, most effective, whether you're a parent, teacher, practitioner, or you yourself are on the autism spectrum. We all want to be effective and efficient, right? And they are they are able to hook us up with information that will help us to be that. So all of this and more and all of this in answering your questions as we continue on with the show, we're going to take a break. Stick with us. We'll be right back. Hi guys, welcome back. For the month of May, I thought it'd be really neat if we made our own bird feeders. What's cool about it is once it's done and it's hung in your front yard, backyard, balcony, or whatever outdoor area that you have, your kids will be able to observe the bird feeder and tap when they see birds coming over and feeding from it. Like, oh my gosh, oh, so exciting. Do you see that? 
Sorry I got distracted. I'm just so excited about all the different birds I've been seeing now that I have a bird feeder hanging outside. Anywho, let's get started. The materials you'll be needing are two and a half cups of bird seed, half a cup of boiling water, two packets of unflavored gelatin, a spatula, twine, scissors, wax paper, and cookie cutters. All right, now that I got your materials, it's super easy. I have my boiling hot half cup of water and I'm gonna take my two packets of unflavored gelatin and I'm gonna pour them in and stir it. The reason I pour it in the water first all by itself is to make sure that the gelatin dilutes really well and I can stir it up real nicely. Now that it's been all stirred together, I'm gonna to take this liquid and pour it into the bird seed. Making sure to scrape up all the gelatin that we diluted. Now I'm just gonna stir it all up. Okay, now that this is all mixed up, I'm gonna take my wax paper and put it on my table just so I don't make a mess. And then I'm gonna take my cookie cutter and lay it down. I'm also gonna take a piece of string and cut it, you know, about six inches long. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fill the cookie cutter halfway full with our bird seed mixture. And I'm gonna take my string, fold it in half, I'm gonna place it in the center. This way you can hang this up once it's done and dry. Now that it's full, I'm just gonna pack it in. So now that this is all compacted, it's gonna take about six hours for the gelatin to get completely hard. If you take it out too soon, the whole thing's gonna fall apart. So let's wait a little bit and I'll see you guys in a few moments. All right, it's been six hours now. So let's see if this little guy worked out. So I'm just gonna pull him up and pop him out, okay? And here's my finished bird feeder. All you have to do now is hang it outside and wait for all the great things you're gonna see. Like, oh, ooh, I see another bird. This is so exciting. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the activity and keep me up to date with all the different birds that you and your child see outside your property. Until next time, craft on. Bye guys. Can you see me? Can you see me flying? by your side welcome back i wanted to take a couple of minutes and talk about we we said earlier this week that our really good friend monica holloway who is the author of the fabulous book um cowboy and wills I, I i just can't even tell you how much i enjoyed this book if you're looking for a good read that has to do with autism, but isn't all autism. I mean, it really is the story of a little boy and his dog. And it's funny. You will laugh. You will cry. You, it just, it's a beautiful, beautiful book. But there is, it's told from the point of view of a mom who is discovering that her child has autism and what that means in her world. But it's a beautiful book. It's a hopeful book. It's, she just, she's a luscious writer, just a luscious writer. And Monica is a regular here now on the show. And please know when I read it, I didn't know her. <laughs> and it's been a treat to get to know her. But Monica has had, uh, had some surgery this week, and so we're sending out our love to her. But typical to Monica, she, you know, because she knew she was going to be out of commission for a little while, put together this lovely, lovely um, document uh, because she's a literacy act. Uh, advocate, uh, she put together some top tips for helping a child with autism to read. You, you just got to love this woman. Anyway, uh, so here are her top tips. And I believe that this is also available on her Facebook page, her Cowboy and Wills uh, Facebook page. I would encourage you to go and give that a like and put it in your uh, things that you, you get to hear from. Put it in your, your news feed because she does a lot of different events and she'll keep you plugged in to things having to do with literacy and autism, which is uh, super duper important. Uh, um, and one of the quotes that we have here is that more than 67% of all U.S. fourth graders scored below proficient and are not reading at grade level, according to a recent report by the Annie E. Casey Foundation. Uh, so 
Monica being the advocate and uh, best-selling author that she is, uh, uh, put this together to help children with autism read more proficiently. And step step number one, top tip number one is keep believing. Teaching your child may, uh, to read may be hard at times, but keep believing. It is one of those things that it comes in, in teeny tiny increments and, and you must do it however you can. I love this next tip. Read aloud. Encourage your child to listen to the story, then follow along with the text and talk about the pictures. I myself subscribe to this wholeheartedly and I was starting to feel bad about it quite honestly, that I'm still reading to my child, but it's such a pleasurable, luscious, lovely thing that we try to do on a regular basis. I won't tell you that we do it every night because sometimes it's just too hectic, but we try to do it every night. And, um, and I was saying to, we had Ashley, uh, Colas with us and I was saying that I feel bad because I'm still reading to him instead of sending him to bed to read his own book, which is what I do occasionally when we can't do the reading. And, um, and that maybe I should be doing that more often. And she was saying, no, that studies show that it's still a wonderful thing, a bonding thing, and it still is helping their reading comprehension when you read to them because it requires them to be able to listen and put things together. But key here, as Monica says, is to encourage them to follow along with the text and to talk about the pictures. Uh, when my son was very little and we didn't know that he had a visual motor problem, uh, what we would do is use our finger. We didn't realize that it was something that was helping him, uh, but we would use our finger to point at each and every word. Uh, then we got visual motor help from him, from him, and eventually we were able to fade that. But it does help them to gain new words and to cite uh, to be able to sight read and keying it into the pictures and asking them questions about the pictures and asking them questions about what's happening in the book uh, is absolutely so beneficial. Um, so I absolutely love this. Right now, my, I, my goal for this summer is that we're going to read the entire Little House on the Prairie books, uh, the, the entire series. So we've already read the Little House in the Big Woods and now we're on the Little House in the Prairie. And I have to tell you that when we were the, at the little house in the big woods he was not into it and I said this is what we're reading we're doing this <laughs> this is important to mommy we're doing this and now we're almost at the end of the little house in the prairie and he's saying to me you know what happens when we get to the end of the book am I going to find out what happens to he's very all about the dog and the animals and and I said to him it's okay honey there are more books and there's even one about a boy in this series so I'm I'm so so jazzed and he's bringing up in conversations about things that they do and we're relating it to food that we eat. It's just been a lovely. Okay, so uh, step three is reread the same stories. Repetition may help your child to learn language. There are some great books out there and if you are somebody who can't afford, because books are expensive, um, there are people who donate books and garage sales are a great place to get kids books and getting a library card. Of course, you have to be up on taking them back on a regular basis so that you don't get a fine. And I am not the best at that. But if you can remember to do that, then it's free. And you can even check out DVDs and uh, if you still do VHS, you know, but they, they do DVDs that you can, you can check out both music CDs and D, uh, movie DVDs. And kids love to go to the library and it's great to instill that in them early on. But rereading the same story is a great thing to do, especially with little kids and the board book kind of thing. Um, uh, the next tip is to include, include reading in the routine. Some children need or like to follow a routine and reading could be incorporated into the schedule of his or her day. It was so important to me early on that I incorporated a, a, into bedtime a reading time, a story time with my son, and it wasn't easy. He was the he was busy pants. That's what we called him. He wanted to be up. He wanted to be running around. And I've talked before about the fact that what settled him is I put a cold apple in his hands and he would sit there and read with me as long as he had the apple. He didn't eat it, but <laughs> there was something about holding that apple. So finding the routine and finding the thing that makes it reinforcing enough for them and, and keep trying who I would never have guessed that a cold apple would have settled him, but it did. Um, involve the team. I love this tip. If you have a support team such as educators, therapists, keep them in the loop and have them work together to help your child to read. Make sure that you're reinforcing it always. Um, 
read books with favorable topics. Choose books that include topics your child enjoys. If your child loves trains or dogs, incorporate these aspects. <clears throat> excuse me, of his life into the reading process. I think this is another great reason to take your child to a library. A bookstore is great too, but my goodness, it even makes my eyes spin, you know, just looking at the prices of books. Uh, recently, my son has gotten very into reading uh, Geronimo Stilton books, and they're they're lovely because the words just jump off the page. They highlight words. Um, and it's, he just, he literally is eating the book now. This is a phrase that my family has. He sits down and he reads it like cover to cover in one sitting, which is fabulous. I just love to encourage this behavior. But every time we go to the store to get one, it's six, seven, eight bucks, um, you know, and, and he can read one in an afternoon. So, you know, it gets pricey. But I do think taking them to the library and having them shop for books and say, what do you want to get? And pulling them out and looking at the cover and seeing, is this a book I want? Looking at the back cover when they're older and seeing, is it something I want? My son loved to go to the part of the, uh, the library that had the space books and that had pictures. And they were, some of them were not in the kids section that had, you know, the planets and things. We have to get out of their way and let them find their passion, right? So find those books with favorable topics. Um, next one, make it fun, right? We've said that many times. If you combine reading with cuddling and playtime or other enjoyable activities, it links books with fun time as well as learning. Good tip, Monica. And um, the next one is be mindful of time. If your child has a t short attention span, then read shorter books to start. Absolutely. And I think, especially with littler kids, uh, include motion and activity in the reading. One of my favorite books, we've got it in the other room, um, is I'm Going on a Bear Hunt. And when you, and there's a whole, you know, it's a picture board book and, you know, I'm going on a bear hunt. We're not afraid. Uh-oh. Right. And then they, they come across, uh, wavy grass and the page says swishy, swashy, swishy, swashy. Well, I always have the child sit with me. And when we do swishy, swashy, we do this whole, you know, swishy, swashy to the point where they're finding it really funny. And the next one, they go into the mud and it's, <laughs> and so I do that noise on them and make their feet do that. Uh, and then there's a whole thing where they run away from the bear and we run with our hands, uh, so it keeps them engaged. And then when you get to the next book, you know, maybe there's a little bit less motion, but you've got them, you get them in the palm of your hand, right? Uh, okay. And, uh, love this one. Associate words with pictures to increase the opportunity for your child to learn words, consider labeling throughout your house to identify objects that correspond with that label and include both the word and a picture uh, for the designated object. Absolutely. If you have a child who is having difficulty uh, learning how to read and you're working on labels already, you go around and you label things all over the house and include a picture and the text. You know, this is a computer mouse. Uh, can I tell you that when my dad had a stroke and he he had some aphasia. We did that with everything in the house to help him, an adult, regain his command of language and understand what things were. Because if we didn't, everything was either orange juice or an umbrella because that's what his brain hooked up. So there's nothing wrong with that. My mother continued doing it years after my father had gotten back his command of all the labels. And we would see, you know, we would see signs everywhere that she would have arrows pointed to things uh, with the name of it and remind her mom, you don't have to do that anymore. Uh, but she, you know, she'd gotten really good at it. Uh, it was really good. So, uh, and Monica also says in this release, no two autism cases are the same and each child learns differently. I encourage, I encourage those with children on the autism spectrum to consult their support team to determine the best plan for helping that child to read. I, I love these tips, Monica. You are awesome. And I, I want to say too, that we've had Emily Island on the show before, and she has a book out, uh, that's on my to-do list this summer. That's just about teaching our kids reading comprehension because because of the way our children have learned and acquired language, it, I, I see this. She talked about this with her son, and I definitely see it in my son, that he can read. My son is a great reader. He reads above grade level, but there's just there can be one word in the sentence that if he has no context for it, 
the meaning of the overall paragraph goes out the window. And it can be to our kids' detriment because uh, her example was that her son was applying for a job and there was one word that he didn't understand and it, you know, it all sort of unraveled. So it became really important to her to work on how do we teach reading comprehension to our kids. So Emily Island, it's spelled I-L-A-N-D. Check out her book. I'm going to be reading it this summer. Uh, okay, we are going to take a break. Uh, and then when we come back, I, I believe if, uh, if, 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 do we have her here yet? Um, not yet. Okay, so when we come back, we've got an, a funding tip for you. And then a little bit later, uh, Dr. Nadowski is on her way to us. We will have Dr. Adele Nadowski, but we'll come back with our funding tip for the week. Stick with us. Currently in the United States, one in 88 children is affected by autism. One in 88 means something different when your child is the one. Recovery is possible. Hi, I'm Shannon Penrod, host of Autism Live, an online show about autism broadcast by CARD, the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. I'm also the mother of a child with autism, my beautiful son, Jem. You know our old joke, guess what? Chicken butt. Chicken butt. So we're going to take the chickens. But things weren't always so easy. I remember when Jem was first diagnosed with autism. I used to lay awake at night in bed and pray for someone or something that could help us to get our child back. My prayers were answered by Dr. Doreen Grandpichet and the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. CARD treats autism and other related disorders using the principles of ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis, which is the only scientifically proven effective treatment for autism. It is also recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics and the U.S. Surgeon General. About a year after we started treatment with CARD, we were able to see tremendous improvement, and we got our child back. What grade are you in? Second. You are a smart cookie, huh? Mm -hmm. Do you like school? Uh, yeah. Do you have any good friends? Yeah, Oscar. Oscar is your best friend? Yeah. And my child is just one of thousands to benefit from CARD ABA therapy. Across the nation and around the world, children are making amazing progress and being given the keys to unlock their full potential. We are extremely grateful for the amazing job CARD has done in helping our daughter. Our daughter today, just in four months, I think is a totally different child than when she started with CARD. I kind of see it as, it, it seems like her brain in a way was asleep and now that we've gotten so many services, uh, we've seen her wake up. Did you have some gases? <laughs> Recovery is possible if you take the right steps, um, if you're willing to put in all the hard work and seven and a half years, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. It's worth every little bit and um, CARD's been there with us every step of the way. I have two children with autism. I can't imagine a day without CARD or the therapists. Um, they've been so instrumental in helping us with our kids and, and shaping their lives and helping us help them. Thank you, Christina Big Alex. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie and Mariana. We've tried other things before ABA, but the most beneficial thing has been ABA services, and I'd be the first person to tell any newly diagnosed family that you have to you have to contact an ABA provider. And if you're lucky enough to have CARD, you're very blessed. Recovery from autism is absolutely a possibility. We've been recovering children for over 20 years. It's just a matter of identifying the child's medical needs, understanding the child's sensory issues, and then teaching the child all of the skills they need in order to function normally. We know there's hope for autism. Autism is treatable and recovery from autism is possible. Welcome back. Uh, we had a question that came in. We were talking about reading comprehension just a minute ago, and somebody wanted to know how should we teach, how should we test, excuse me, reading comprehension to our kiddos in school? And I think that's a really brilliant question, and I don't, I certainly don't have the answer for that, and I don't know, uh, 
I don't know that I like the answer that exists right now because the way that they currently test reading comprehension in schools is that they do those standardized testing. And I, you know, that's the litmus test where we judge my son because I think those are the kinds of things that we have in real life. So maybe that is the right way. It tears my ticket though, as a parent and as a teacher, because it's random. <laughs> and I will tell you an example that, uh, for instance, there was, and this was a math question, not a reading comprehension question, uh, but my son came close to scoring 100 on the math uh, for this one standardized test that they did. And when we looked at, there were two questions that he missed. And one of them, it was being able to judge the relative distance of something they said, uh, they said, uh, if you were to take a CD case and measure a tree uh, using a CD case, how many CD cases do you think the tree would uh, it would take to measure the tree. Uh, and this is the perfect example because he didn't have a reference for a CD case. So in his head, he went to a case of something and that seemed like a big thing. And, and you were given four numbers and some of the numbers were large and some of them were small. And you kind of had to do, make this relative judgment based on the size of, you had to know what a CD case looked like. And he didn't, uh, this was probably when he was in second grade, um, and I just found that maddening, uh, you know, uh, it was quite a leap for a second grader to make. Um, and there are, and the reading comprehension things are filled with things like that. Uh, we've gone through many of the tests with, with Jem and practiced for them. And I find them difficult that, so if I find them difficult, uh, you know, there'll, there'll be a whole paragraph about, uh, there was one in particular that we just did on this last set of tests about how, uh, somebody was in the house and they heard a loud bang and there was in the middle of a storm and then they went outside and they saw that their olive tree uh, was dead and that they decided to pick the olives and give them to the neighbor and the neighbor had picked their olives and given them to them and you were supposed to make all these inferences and then they wanted to know what happened to the tree and your choices were uh, that the tree was struck by lightning, that the tree was old and was battered by the wind. Um, and then there were two that were throwaways, right? Which there always isn't a multiple choice, two that were throwaway. Now, because of the loud bang and the, it was the middle of the storm and there was a reference later on about the tree being split in different directions, I'm going to assume that it was lightning because of the reference from the bang. But, you know, there it's such a fine line there in terms of could it be that the tree was old and battered by the wind? Could the bang have happened because it hit the ground? I, I just found it a little maddening. And for a fourth grader, you know, here I am, I'm 50 and I could have argued it, but then I can argue a lot of things. In any case, um, I, I just, I think it's really difficult, but in life, when people are talking to our kids, they sometimes reference things that are so out there that our kids miss. So maybe it is the best way to test it. Uh, I'm just, I'm just not sure. Uh, okay. And so you're writing back saying, or someone is writing back saying, my son can breeze through oral reading, but when he is tested, he fails. It's frustrating not knowing if he is comprehending anything. Well, uh, you know what I do with my son um, to kind of gauge is that we read something like, you know, we'll read a chapter from the Little House in the Prairie book, and then I'll say to him, um, you know, so what do you think's going on? And let him put it in his words and tell me what we just read. And then I'll ask him something about something, and he answers it. And I not only do that the night of, but I do it the next day, too, because it's interesting to see what he remembers from the next day. A lot of times I'll say, do you remember what we read last night? He says, no, I have no memory of what we read. And then I might have to prompt him a little bit with, oh, you know, it was the part where he was hunting the bear. Oh, yeah. And then I ask him to tell me what he remembers from the chapter. And so in that way, I can kind of see a portion of what he's picking up. But you don't really know all the little ins and outs. Uh, it's really difficult to know exactly everything that they get in it. Is frustrating. And I think that it's inefficient um, when they get tested at school. And 
the thing that I remember that Temple Grandin said, she, she said, because I was talking to her about my son's report card and that it was really important to me, you know, that he wasn't doing well in one area and that it was showing up on the report card. And she said, Shannon, let go of that. Like, what does that matter? You matter about his life skills and he's not going to get an A in everything. And he's not, you know, let that go. Uh, you know, if he doesn't get an A in, in math because they're doing the baby math, but he's doing a college class where they're doing calculus, who cares? about what's, what it says on the report card. And that was a real big wake-up call to me that I put a lot of store into what the grades are and what the test says. But I think it's more por important, and I think that as parents, we, we have a certain sense for what, uh, what our kids are getting and aren't getting, and we can quiz them. So it is frustrating, and I, I encourage you to accept that it's frustrating and that I don't think our kids are ever going to show exactly what they do on a test. Okay, <laughs> you know, and, and moving on. But, you know, do you feel like it's affecting his functioning in life? Because that's what Emily Island got to, that it was holding her son back from getting the job he wanted. And that's when, uh, you know, we want to get there before that. Do you feel like when your child reads something that he's able to talk with you about it. That would be my question to you. In any case, I promised that we were going to do a funding tip. And, and what I wanted to talk particularly about today is those copays. I know I've asked all of you at the beginning of the show to make sure that you check out our Facebook and contact the, the people in California and let them know your opinion that this law should not pass, that they should not... Uh, make it so that no regional center is paying for co-pays and deductibles. But for those of you who are families who are, are faced with, you've got the insurance reform now and you're faced with the co-pay. And I know a lot of you have had the horrible circumstance where you've, you've looked at it and said, okay, well, we can either pay our mortgage or, or we can eat or we can pay for the co-pay and the deductible. And that there's a sick feeling that comes up January 1st when you got to come up with it again. I want to remind you that there are resources out there for that money. First of all, I want to point to the United Chil Children's Healthcare Fund. It is a one-time grant of $5,000 when you apply and you do not have to have United Healthcare uh, in order to apply for or get the grant. A one-time $5,000 grant that must go to things that are proven to be effective, right? Um, and so I'm told that you can use those that $5,000 grant for a copay or a deductible. So that would take care of one year. It's a lot of paperwork and you kind of have to have your ducks in a row to do that, but well worth it. Uh, you can only get it one time, but that's a year and a year can make all the difference. Uh, so United Children's Healthcare Fund. Also want to remind you that ACT Today, uh, you can visit them at www.act-today.org is uh, now going to begin to grant for copay and deductibles. Uh, and they are also a $5,000 grant, a maximum of it. You can get grants for less. And honestly, you know, they don't have enough to go around. So, you know, uh, Make sure that that's how you want to spend that grant. And sometimes you can reapply with them to get another grant. But uh, they, you can check out on their website and start the process. There are only certain times a year where they're open for grants, but you can check out when the next grant phase is. I believe there's one coming up. Also want to let you know that um, the Jewish Free Loan Association will lend interest-free money uh, to you that you have to pay back on a monthly basis that sometimes that meets the gap. Um, and there are also organizations Organizations such as Lend for Health, you can find their site, lend the number for health.org, that will lend money also for you for your child to be able to get treatment. So there are four things there, four different ways that you can combat. And I also remind you that you can always have a fundraiser. When you let people know, hey, I've got to raise two or three or five thousand dollars to enable my child to have a hundred thousand dollars worth of therapy, you'll find that people want to help and support you. And if you need help figuring out how to do that fundraiser, let me know that I, that's something I'm, I'm good at. I can give you some ideas of how to use your resources to have that fundraiser for your kids, but don't, don't look at that amount and say, I guess we're just not going to be able to do it. Uh, because it, while it's a large number, 
and it seems overwhelming, it is the small number that gets you access to the big funding. So we don't give up on that, right? Write in if you need help. We're here for you. We'd like to support you in making sure that you get that. We fought hard for that insurance reform. You need to get the benefit of it. Don't let that copay or deductible stand in your way. There are resources available to you. Okay, we're going to take a break and we're going to bring Dr. Adele Nadowski in. It's time for Real Progress with Dr. Adele. Stick with us. Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Lisa Ackerman with Taka. My Hi. guest here. I am Jennifer Lucero with Taka. Taka Moms here in the house. Jeff saw on a TV commercial, they were making calzones. And he looked at me and goes, Mom, please make me that. Wait a minute. Yeah, calzone. You can't have calzone. He goes, well, you make me pizza. Why don't we call it a puzzone? So we're going to do this ode to Jeff. Uh, Pizzone. I'm gonna have Jen come on in. All right, you're on charge. Ready. We're gonna add a little grapeseed oil, garlic, cut up chicken, finely cut up onion, and we're gonna throw a little bit of basil. So we're gonna just take about five minutes or so, saute up the chicken and all of the onions together. While Jen is slaving away at the stove, I'm gonna make um, the pizza crust. A lot of gluten-free choices that you have out there. Uh, for pizza crust. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with the dry. Again, I'm using eggs. There are a lot of egg replacers on the TACA website. We have uh, about a dozen different ways to replace eggs. So I'm gonna go ahead and add my shortening. Calls for a little extra salt, which I'm gonna put in here. And also add a little pepper. And we also have herbs de Provence that gives the crust a nice Italian flavor. Can't forget the apple cider vinegar, organic stuff ready to go. Yes, I have all my ingredients. We're ready to rock with this mixer. And don't be afraid of dough. Dough doesn't bite, so. Here's what we'll be working with to make the puzzone. I'm ready to go. Let's get this party started. So what we're gonna do next is roll out the dough. I like to be rolling in the dough, but we're gonna roll out the dough instead. So let's go ahead and get started here with that. So again, you see me using the parchment paper all the time. Love this stuff. It's basically unbleached, ready to go. It's just, just going to make life a lot easier on your rolling pin. You don't need to coat it or anything, which is a lot easier. But I swear I should buy that by the gross ton. So the pizzones, this basically makes two big pizzones. I'm going to take half of the dough and roll it out. Um, half of the other dough will be for the other pizzone that we're going to make in just a little bit. So you want to do, you're not making a pie crust. You're kind of making a long oval shape. So we're going to try to make a shape where I'm going to basically roll this over with all the yummy fillings. And so any combination or variation thereof. This sauce, just real simple, mm -hmm. is um, organic crushed tomatoes. Mm -hmm. I've added a little bit of salt and pepper and herbs de Provence in that as well, which I love. I like extra fresh basil. That's always yummy to have on your puzzone. And thank you, this turned out fantastic. So we're just basically building it the way that we want to eat it. Of course, my favorite uh, rice-free, um, organic, dairy-free, soy-free cheese. It's gonna pop out the sides. Okay. I'm not afraid of popping out the sides. So that's the beauty of the parchment paper. Once you're done, you just flip it over and peel it back. So I'm just taking a fork now and going around the edges. It looks so pretty. It looks really nice. So for 400 degrees, mm -hmm. we're going to go for about 25 minutes. You want it golden brown. And because we cooked everything pretty much already, you're not worried about not having everything fully cooked. Mm -hmm. So look and how yeah. cute those look. That's great. I mean, there's four happy people right there. For this sure. weighs a ton. So let's go to the magic oven. Pull out our finished product. Mm, and voila! Good. Oh my oh, gosh, it this beautiful. is so yummy. There's nothing better than a little Jeff Ackerman Pizzone. 
And this is going to be nuclear hot, but we'll yeah. go ahead and cut and open so you can. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is going to taste so good that later on great. for your kids. Yum. Feedback, keep it coming. Thank you for helping, Jen. Thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us. Um, come back to Autism Live. We'll keep doing allergy friendly cooking classes. If you have any suggestions or things that you would like to see us make, bring it on. You can reach us at autismlive at gmail.com or Facebook. Love the Facebook. I know, too much for me. Uh, Facebook, so facebook.com slash autismlive or thousands of taco recipes ready to go. Um, basically go to taco now, T-A-C-A-N-O-W dot O-R-G. And we'll see you next time. You say hi, we say hi. Let's get right, let's get right, let's get right. Welcome back to Autism Live. It is time for Real Progress with Dr. Adele. And Dr. Adele Nadowski is here with us. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me again. I haven't seen you in a while because I was away a couple of weeks ago and then you were away last week. You were at ABAI. In Minneapolis, yes. And was it fabulous? It was fabulous, yes. I have to say, we went, uh, Autism Live went the year before last and we had a great time and we it just wasn't in the cards for us this year. And then as you all left, I, I felt bereft. I wanted to go. I missed it. I know. It would have been great to have you there. And, and it was a lovely, how, just thousands of people, I'm sure. Yeah, thousands of people. Um, the only thing that was bad about it was the weather. It was freezing oh, and raining. Really? Yeah. Wow. But, um, you know, it's an indoor thing anyways. You're, it keeps you more involved, I guess, with going to all the presentations and everything. But um, we had a workshop. We had a lot of talks. We had um, great attendance and all of those things. We also held a little reception, and we had over 250 people. Wow. So it was very good. Very exciting. Yeah. Very exciting. Now, I had asked you to come two weeks ago to talk about what kind of things we can do to maintain uh, status and create progress in the summer. Because as, as it approaches, I mean, there are some people that are already out of school. Today's the last day. And a lot of times it's going to be an overwhelming time of year uh, where you feel like, oh, yes. I don't know what I'm doing. And, and there is the real potential to lose skills over yes. the summer for all kids not just kids on the spectrum right so what are some ideas that we can do to have a productive summer so first off if you if you're feeling panicky like my child's going to lose skills what are those skills that you're worried about because mm -hmm. i'm sure it's some more than others mm -hmm. that maybe are a little bit more uh likely to be lost, I guess. Um, when that's the case, maybe try to think of things you could do to keep those maintained or even to keep teaching over the summer. Um, that could involve, you know, um, doing extra hours. Normally, if your child's in school, you can't do as many hours of one-to-one -one ABA instruction, so you mm -hmm. could increase your ABA instruction if you wanted to work on the things that you're worried about losing. Yeah. Um, if you don't have someone to provide that, you can always use skills um, mm -hmm. and let it help to guide you and get lesson plans from skills. And I have to say, you know, today is the last day of May. If you're thinking about doing, if you've been thinking about skills, it's been, you know, one of those things in the back of your head, you should do it today because it's 20% off, not just for this month, but for the lifetime of your subscription. So yeah, that is 20 very good. 20% off for however long you keep it. And, and today's the last day. And we've never done that before. That lifetime of the subscription, 20% off thing. So that's really it's good. an amazing opportunity. Uh, so if you're thinking about it, do it. Yeah. Uh, so, And then obviously, in addition to that, you have all this extra free time. So why not work on doing things out in the community, make trips mm -hmm. out to the community, do fun things, and bring along targets and things you want to try to work on in those environments, yeah. especially if you choose ones that are very reinforcing um, we you were talking to me earlier about like if they really like to swim at the pool, you could go to the pool and you could actually work on things there so that there's like a natural uh, reinforcer present. It's a very enriched yeah. environment. It's fun. Uh, I think we get stuck in this idea that if we're going to work with our child and we're going to use the principles of ABA, that we're going to be home and there's going to be a table and that we're going to have gotten really good at being able to put down cards and pick them up quickly. And it doesn't have to be that way, right? No, it really doesn't. Um, I say every single thing and every moment is a learning opportunity with a child. Uh, if you are, you know, making breakfast, they can help to identify uh, the labels of the items or help to get the items or yeah. even learn the steps of making something simple. Yeah. Um, learn about sequencing. I mean, there's so many learning opportunities in every single thing oh, you do. You go to the crazy. store. 
They can help to identify the items in the um, aisles. They can put them in the cart. They can help maybe learn about money. Yeah. Um, it kind of goes on and on. So every little thing you're doing every single day, I would bring a learning opportunity into that. Yeah. Even thinking about the breakfast, I'm thinking, okay, you got the hard boiled egg. And so we have a whole egg and then we cut it in half. Yeah. And so now we're talking about fractions. Now there's two, two halves. Yeah. Uh, you know, so this is one half and this is the other half. And then we cut it again and now we have quarters. Yeah. You, know? and you can bring it to the level of the child. Maybe they don't yeah. understand fractions. So maybe you're just counting. We have yeah. one. Now let's count. We have two. Yes. Now we can cut it again. We have four. Um, what color is it? What shape is it? Yeah. Uh, what do you do with it? You eat it. You know, it goes on and on. So um, there's always these opportunities. But also, I would make sure to do some stuff to make uh, get the child involved with peers a lot. Yeah. So make sure they're not isolated over the summer. Um, I'm sure there's some really great camps that they can get enrolled in if they need an aid. I'm sure the camps wouldn't mind if the aid attended because a lot of times the aid helps all the other children too. Um, social groups might be a good thing to sign up for over the summer. Yeah. Uh, just setting up play dates and getting together with other kids for more learning opportunities. Yeah. Um, all of those things I think would be great to do during the summer just to make sure that you're constantly teaching and working on things and maintaining the things that the child has learned in the past. Yeah. I, I had a really interesting conversation the other day. Uh, we, we have a wonderful person here who works in this building who has an adult child who recovered from autism. And she's such a great resource for me that, you know, sometimes she just somehow I run into her in the hallway or she wandered into my office and I said, since you're here, I got to ask you, you know, I always will ask parents who got it done and in whatever way, shape or form, not all kids recover. We know that, but you know, what'd you do right? That's the, that's the question I always want to ask parents. What did you do right? And one of the things that she said to me was, she said, I had play dates in my house every day that I, I found, she said, I went out and shopped my neighborhood until I found the family. And you just saw the level of determination on her face. Here it is all these years later, and her son is very successful in college and drives his truck as employee of the month where he works and, you know, is leading a full, rich life. And, and she says, I shopped the neighborhood, and I found the family that had a bunch of kids that if three of them were missing because they were at my house making popsicles, it was going to be okay. Okay. The mom wasn't going to be constantly calling and saying, you know, they have to come home right now. Right. And she said, and I made it fun for those kids to come to my house every day. And we had an activity to do. But my child, because he's an only child and mine is too. She said, my child was never playing by himself in the house. And I went, okay, you know, I have now heard it. I, I need to get on that because my, my child asks for play dates. And I'm, I'm reluctant. I'm just always reluctant. Wow, he's asking. That's amazing. That's yes, really good. he asks for play dates all the time. And he has kids at school who say, can I come over and play? And I, you know, I just have to, that's one of those things I got to get on this summer. Because opportunity, you guys talk about this all the time. The opportunity to, to learn is so key. If we don't yeah. give them enough opportunities and we expect them to be able to do something in just one opportunity, we wouldn't do that to ourselves. Yeah, it's all about practice if you think about yeah. it like that with everything in life. Yeah. You want to be good at a sport, you got to practice. You want to be and good at anything, you have to practice. And I think I needed for that mom to yeah. say to me, I, this was my other full-time job was making it play date central. Yeah. That if there was downtime, you know, that he had at least two friends that overwhelmed me a little bit. I got to be honest, but she said, no, once I got it hooked up, once I made it so exciting for them to be at my house, they just were at my door all the time. <laughs> You know, and that hadn't occurred to me right. uh, that, you know, that if you invest the time that it could just start happening uh, organically on its own. So social, a huge part of this, yeah. this journey for all of our kids. Yeah. And if we if we were to up the opportunity for them, uh, we're much more likely to see success in lots of different areas. Yes. OK, so. uh it, 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 you know, we have we have families that are out there and dealing with all different kinds of circumstances. Uh, but is this something that if you're working with a team that you sit down and talk with a team and say, hey, you know, what is our game plan for progress over the summer? Oh, yeah, definitely. So um, hopefully the ABA supervisor doesn't go away just because it's summertime. So this is a very good time to talk with them and to start planning what is going to be uh, happening over the summer and come up with activities and kind of like some sort of an idea of a schedule, maybe yeah. um, get him and get the children enrolled and whatever they're going to be enrolled in and have things planned out.
Yeah. Yeah. It's so important to have a plan. Yeah. Even if, if you, if you, even if you don't end up following the plan, uh, fully, completely, if you have a plan, it's sort of, there is something about that, that if you say, okay, you know, you're going to camp this week and you register, then somehow they miraculously go off to camp that week. Yeah. Uh, it just has a way of unfolding exactly. uh, our busy, busy lives. Yep. Uh, and so do you have big plans over the summer? Uh, my, well, you know, I work full time yes. and, um, so my son is enrolled in a camp like every single week, but he's going to do a lot of fun things. He's doing an art camp. Uh-huh. He's doing a science camp. Um, he's going to be, uh, in a baseball camp and then a few other just kind of all around fun camps. It seems to be a very California thing that, you know, these shorter camps and I, I kind of really like it because it leaves room for us to go away and come back and say, okay, you know, we'll do this camp this week. And then I, I like to give Jem a week of camp and then a week off where yeah, we can do cool. things. Um, and I kind of like that. I, I hear from other people around the country though, that there's, there's t- t- tends to be camp and you send them to camp and it's the whole summer and we have that here too but i always shy away from that because it seems very rigid and uh i like i like to be a little more go with the flow in the summer yeah i think it's good too it creates flexibility and it gives them um, opportunities to meet new people and to um, expand themselves a little bit beyond yeah. what they're used to every single day so yeah actually i hadn't thought about that before but uh you know, when, when Jem went to one camp for a week, he went to crazy chemistry, I think was one of the first ones that he did. And, and he thought, okay, that's what camp is. This is what camp is. And we go in and the person teaches and we do this and da, 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 da. And then he had a week off. And then the next week, I think it was the Harry Potter camp that he went to. That was an entirely different camp with different kids. That sounds fun. It was bizarre. It was just bizarre. They made wands and they made chocolate frogs and it was just bizarre. I didn't, didn't really see the benefit in it, to be honest with you. Not like crazy chemistry where he got a bunch of science right. things. So then, then he took a marine biology one and that, that I thought was really cool. But he got to see, okay, camp means a lot of different things and the schedule is a little bit different. I think it may have helped him with flexibility. Yeah seeing that it's not just one way and it's a good way to introduce new things to your child so maybe yeah. they don't do music right now but maybe they would like to and they just don't know because yeah. they've never done it before absolutely um or art or whatever it is yeah, yeah. and doing it for a week you know we it's can a all, taste yeah we can all do anything for a yeah. week right exactly <laughs> And they should be making it fun. I, that's a key, too, is that we, sh- we have to schedule in some fun. Yes. And that whatever we're doing, whatever teaching opportunity, it's got to be fun-related. That's right. Okay. Well, fabulous. And so we've made you come all this way, and I feel like we kept you for a very short period of time. That's okay. I'm feeling all guilty. I don't mind. Uh, but we so appreciate it. And uh, we will be back with you next week. Yes. Okay. Uh, all right. So stick with us. We're going to take a look now at the A word. This is the ongoing documentary being made here at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. Following a little boy, Jack Riley, we're seeing at this point, they're working on the toileting. It's very exciting. So take a look. This is the A word. And then when we come back, we're going to be joined by Dr. Jonathan Tarbox. So stick with us. I know a cute little blue eyed boy and his name is Jack. He got a big, warm, blue-eyed soul that makes your heart beat fast. This is day three of potty training. Well, we think he's learning to pee on the potty. No big successes yet and lots and lots of accidents. Here is the laundry from today. (laughs) Ready? (laughs) 25 weeks ago, Jack Riley had a huge breakdown when Jessica asked him to sit down a direction that's usually very easy for him to do. At the time, no one knew he had to go potty. He didn't have the language to tell his parents or Jessica that he needed time. Jack, what are you doing? Pooping. You're pooping? Oh, okay. (laughs) Jumped to four weeks ago, and you can see he is now able to communicate what he needs when a demand is placed on him, instead of tantruming like he did before when he didn't have language. Okay. How do you know when a kid's ready for potty training? So, a couple of the prerequisites to know when a kiddo is ready is they wake up dry in their pull-up or diaper, and um, when they do actually do go in their pull-up or diaper, like during the day when they're awake, they let you know that they went number one or number two, depending on what it is. It's like you have no choice but Let's to pee. Let's try it. Let's do it. Help. No, you, no, I can't help you pee. Help. I can hold your hand, but I can't help you pee. So the purpose of the potty log is just to see how long it takes them as soon as they sit on the potty 
for them to actually urinate and the amount of time that um, he's able to hold his urine. And with the log, we're able to visually see how long it takes them each time, if they have the accidents or not. He's on a half hour potty schedule. So if he doesn't go when we take him, then we have to take him in 10 more minutes. So every 10 minute intervals until he does go. And then we reset the clock and it's 30 minutes again. Okay, buddy. Okay, last chance. Last chance to go pee pees. Did we reset it for 10? Oh, what does that mean? What does that mean, Jack? It's potty time. You can come right after. Hurry, hurry. No. Uh oh, he wet himself. Uh oh. oh. We can reset to half an hour now. To make sure Jack Riley uses the potty regularly, they have been giving him lots of fluids and salty foods. Welcome back to Autism Live, our very special guest, Dr. Jonathan Tarbox. I said it's like old home week because I hadn't seen you or Dr. Nadowski in a couple of weeks. Great to be back. Uh, thrilled to have you here. You were very, very missed. You were both at ABAI, ABA, ABA International last week, and we didn't get to go this time, and we missed you. We missed you, too. So tell me, because there was a lot that was going on there, and there were a lot of presentations that were being done by CARD people, and as the head of research and development at the Center for Autism, and related disorders, and as the director of the Autism Research Group, I'm just going to assume that you had your finger on the pulse. <laughs> we were pretty busy. <laughs> I'll bet you were. Yeah, so it was a really exciting conference. I mean, um, I don't even know where to start. You know, yeah. there's thousands of people dedicated to helping kids with autism, as well as lots of other applications of behavior analysis, right. too. Um, tons of developments happening. Um, lots and lots of attention to um, skills, which was really nice. I mean, that's it's cool. you know, it's been something that's been developing that people are um, gaining awareness about, uh -huh. um, and it's something that we know is incredibly useful if people just right. to check it out. You right. know, they'll see what right. it has to offer. Um, and just every year, more and more people are realizing that, and they're actually yeah. contacting that. So that was very rewarding. You know what I've come to think of skills like smartphones. <laughs> you know how when you you know you see somebody doing the smartphone, you go, oh, that's really cool, and you get your smartphone, and there's that week or so where you're yeah. like, ah. I don't even know how to turn it on. That's right. What do I do? And then you you use it for a little while, and you go, okay, this is cool. And then you see somebody doing something with it, and you go, it can do that, too? Right. Yeah, yeah. Re I didn't know it could do that. And even the stage before that. Remember when smartphones first came out, and mm -hmm. just sort of the nerdy early adopters had them, and everyone mm -hmm. else was kind of thinking, really? Do I really yes. need do that? I, do, do I really I, need yeah. a computer and a scheduler and an internet and all right. this stuff all in one device? And now we and can't now, live without it? Yeah, now we yeah. literally can't even imagine having a dumb oh. phone, right? And yeah. and yeah, we could live without it just fine. And now there's so much more we can do because we yes. have that. This is the same thing with skills. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I I encourage people to. We've, we mentioned before, it's the last day they're having a sale. Oh, and, today's uh, last day? Today's the last day, 20% off for the lifetime of the subscription. So it's a pretty good deal. Uh, it is a very good deal. But so, but there were a lot of other things that were going on at the conference, uh, and you you had people from the team presenting. Mm -hmm. What kinds of topics? Oh, all what kinds. Did I, what did I miss? All kinds of stuff. Uh, Fill me so, in. Uh, so one of the uh, symposia that we participated in was on um, issues of complex behavior mm -hmm. and applying behavior analysis or ABA to really complex behaviors and uh, cognitive skills. Mm -hmm. And so um, I talked about some of the work that we're doing that you know my my great team here is doing. Uh, people like Angela Persky and Adele Nadowski and all of them on stuff like um, uh, understanding metaphors, perspective taking, all that kind of thing. Basically, the point I was trying to make was ABA is equally applicable to really complex skills that most 
most people think of as brain functions, but brain functions involve people doing stuff too. It's all teachable, right? right? We talk right. about it all, this, all the time on your show. Um, but still, probably 95% of the presentations that you see at an ABA conference are still about relatively basic, straightforward behaviors and skills, which are critical. Things like, you know, asking for stuff when you want it, or yeah. toilet training, or decreasing right. problem behavior. Critical stuff, right? Right. But there's a lot more to human behavior than just that foundational stuff. So yeah. um, we had a really good reception for that. People were very interested. Um, people, you know, wanted to know more information about it, wanted to pr- collaborate with us on research in these areas, um, and got a very warm reception for that whole topic area of complex right. behavior. So that was that was really, um, it was fun. I have to say, I've been talking with a mom whose son was recently diagnosed, um, five years old, uh, and very uh, high functioning and, you know, excited about all the things that he can do, but wanting to really get in there and do some, and work on some of the things. And all of the, the pediatricians who diagnosed said, when when she said, so I want to do ABA with this child, they said, oh, no, 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 ABA is for all those beginning skills. Right. It's not for Simple kids stuff. that already are Touch talking. And, if, and he's already toilet trained, so right. you won't want, that's a, such a waste of his time. All the pediatricians saying that. And then she said, oh, but I was under the impression, having watched the show, I was under the impression that those higher skills, you know, those critical executive function skills and cognition skills and social skills could be worked on. And all the pediatricians are saying, oh, no, 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 no. Right, because right. um, they think it's just a brain function. And if you right. truly believe it's only a brain function, thinking is only a brain function and nothing else, yeah. then of course it's not teachable. You don't directly teach the brain, you teach behavior, you teach skills. Yeah. And then that interacts with brain functions to make someone be able to actually function better in their daily yeah. life. I just wonder how long it's going to take before the pediatricians see oh. enough of our kids and say, what did you do with this child that made the difference? Because I know that's what happened with our pediatrician. Yeah, well, honestly, though, think about how long, and I don't mean to trash talk the discipline of, uh, you know, pediatricians by any means, but think about how long it took for them to even acknowledge that ABA works for anything, yes. right? It was a couple couple decades behind. Yeah, reality, and some of them so. still don't, if we're yeah. quite honest. Some of them right. are still behind there. A lot of there. them still aren't aware. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I guess it's, it's just, you know, it's that awareness curve that we keep plugging away at. And, you know, the truth of the matter, too, is um, a lot of ABA folks don't specialize in these complex, higher-functioning skills. Yes. And so, yeah, the truth is they don't apply ABA to that, and that's fine. That's not right. what they specialize in. Right. Everyone's different. Everyone has their own areas of specialty. Uh, so to some extent, it's a fair criticism in that there aren't a lot of ABA folks out there who actually know how to teach these right. uh, more complex, higher-functioning skills. Right. Okay. So that's part of what we're doing is trying to yes. get this information out there. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so so that was one of the different symposium areas that symposium, how do you, symposium, Symposi- symposia. Symposia. Is symposia. Yeah. And what else? What else did you guys weigh in on? Um, so the first one was about this topic, but more talking conceptually about how to do it, sort of describing our strategies that we've taken. Mm-hmm. Um, another symposium showcased some more of our more recent research, touching on some of these areas, okay. um, and also some more sort of self-care skills. So we um, showed data from, uh, Michelle Bishop showed data from a, uh, a study we just published on teaching kids to tolerate having their teeth brushed. Ooh. I'm not sure if we talked about that study yet on your show. No, I don't think so, right? we need to talk about that study. Okay, well, let's do it. So <laughs> this study just came out in Research and Autism Spectrum Disorders, and uh-huh. um, the authors are Amy Kenzer, Michelle Bishop, uh, myself, Courtney Tarbox, Tara Landigan, and a few others um, contributed. And basically what we did was we took kids who were afraid of having their teeth brushed uh-huh. and didn't want the toothbrush in their mouth and didn't want any dental procedures happening right. in their mouth at all, and we gradually desensitized to desensitized them to it uh, using really big positive reinforcers or rewards okay. and really gradually fading in the demands so slowly that the kids almost didn't notice that it was ah. happening. And in the course of, I don't know, a few weeks or a month or so, all of the kids that participated in this study um, would tolerate their mother brushing their teeth or father, whoever uh-huh. the caregiver was, brushing their teeth for, you know, the full dental recommended uh, duration or whatever. Okay. Um, so they went from, you know, screaming, crying, running away at the beginning of the study, no successful toothbrushing at all. The parents would try to do it when they're asleep or whatever, but basically it just wasn't happening. Wow. Um, by the end of the study, no problem. Mom says, okay, let's brush your teeth. And the kid says, okay, and brush their teeth. And they're even smiling and it's a game and it, and it worked great. Okay, so this is great. And I, I, I need this because my child brushes his own teeth, but we're not getting enough, right? Right. right. And, and not vigorously enough. And when I try to do it, you know... <laughs> 
<laughs> it's a nightmare. Yeah. It looks like a clown car. Things are popping out of things. It's just like insanity, and he's yeah. moving away from me, and I'm sure. chasing him with a toothbrush, and the dog is barking, and it's right. it's mayhem. Okay. It's so, total mayhem. So here's the key to what we did. Um, as you know, and as I, th I think probably most of your viewers know, um, if you don't want a kid to escape from something, mm -hmm. you can, there's, there's a couple of different things you can do. You can put escape behavior on extinction, which right. means you kind of just make them follow through with it anyways. Okay. Right, which is me um, following him works. with a toothbrush. Right, and that will work, but <laughs> it also encourages the kid to try to escape in yes. the short run. You might get extinction bursts, right, which means the right. kid gets more upset and tries harder to escape. Right. Um, and it's basically not that much fun. It'll work if you're yeah. consistent, but man, you got to be consistent. Yeah. Another way to decrease escape maintain behavior is to remove the motivation right. to escape. Okay. Right. So you make the situation something that the child isn't motivated to escape from. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to do it, but the two biggest ways to do it are to use lots of positive reinforcement okay. in the situation. So that makes the whole situation more rewarding and more fun. Okay. Uh, but the other main thing that we did, the, really the key component, is to decrease whatever the kid doesn't like about the situation, decrease. It, to the okay. point where it's just not even present anymore and then gradually fade it back in. Okay. So let me give you an example. Yes, please. You know, let's say this is a toothbrush and you want to uh, uh, brush your, you know, your child's teeth. You might say, all right, we're gonna, you know, let's brush your teeth, open your mouth and just kind of go for it, right? right? Well, immediately you're presenting a situation your child wants to escape from. Right. So what you're doing is increasing motivation to escape. Right. What we want to do is decrease motivation to escape, right? Okay. So what we did was we came up with, I think it was like a 30-step procedure where the first step was such a minor amount of toothbrushing that there was no motivation to escape. Okay. So it's something like this. Okay, let's brush your teeth. Great job! Give them a reinforcement. <laughs> okay. okay, and it sounds ridiculous, but right. this is what worked. Let's it remind worked. ourselves yeah. this is what worked. It worked for right. all three kids, okay. and it worked, and even though it was slow and tedious, they were done, and they liked toothbrushing by the end. You and so overall, us. it actually worked in a shorter amount of time, because how long right. have you been hassling with this problem, right? Forever. Forever. Right. He's going to be 10. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> so step one is, we're going to brush your teeth. Show him the toothbrush before he even has an opportunity to resist. Hide the toothbrush, give a reward, like that. You don't make him do anything. Just okay. Show him okay. Step two, and you do that a few times until basically what starts to happen is your kid gets used to just looking at the toothbrush, right? Okay. And you do it from about this far away, okay? okay. Next step two is I something like this. this. We're going to brush teeth. Okay. Great job. <laughs> okay. So now instead of seeing the toothbrush for half a second, you see the toothbrush for like two seconds. And can I tell you, you that I love reward. that you're showing it this way because I would try to rush it. Right. I would right. try to rush it. Let's right. be of course. honest. Yeah. So I love that. So you do that multiple times until okay. your kid's used to that and not trying to escape. And in fact, here's the cool thing is they're not going to try to escape if you just go like this. Right. Right. So right. you avoid the problem to begin right. with. And what you're doing also, though, is using positive reinforcement, huge positive reinforcement. So you're reinforcing your child's behavior of paying attention and right. Not right. running away, right? right. Okay. How so, do you know how soon to change it? Like, did you do this three days? It was the same with all three kids. You gauge it on the child. Well, we we had a criterion that we came up with. It's okay. all there in the article. I forget exactly what it was, but it's something okay. like probably like three trials in a row without any escape behavior okay. and without any screaming or something like that. Okay. Um, and as long as they're successful, then on the next day, you go to step two. And okay. then as long as they get that three trials in a row, the next day you go to step three. And it might be more than three trials. It might be like six trials in a row or something okay. like that. And I don't think there's any research proving that it has to be this criteria or that criteria. You just have to have a criteria so you know right. what you're doing and, um, and be consistent. Yeah. Um, what we also then did was we would probe ahead a couple steps every now and then just uh -huh. to see, you know, it seems like he's doing really well. Let's skip ahead a couple steps. Right. And instead of going, you know, one second, two second, three second, let's skip ahead to placing the toothbrush six inches from the mouth for okay. one second and just see if he can tolerate that. Okay. And if he can, great. Then we just right. skip three steps, right? Okay. Um, if he can't tolerate it, no problem. Go back to the earlier All one. Right. Okay. At no point were we ever making the kid do any of the steps. So this, okay. and your, your viewership needs to pay attention here and be very All careful. Right. This is the opposite of what we normally recommend, right? We, we intentionally let the child escape if he had bad behavior. Okay. And the reason why we did that was because we wanted to let him know this is not going to be scary. We're not going to force okay. you to do anything. We're going to just motivate you to make the choice to do it. Okay. Um, and so if the kid turned his head, pushed, this, pushed the toothbrush away or ran away, we'd say, no problem. We're done for the day. You, you can escape. Okay. No big deal. Okay. Start again the next day at a lower step. Um, so the idea is you increase the steps... Um, where the amount that you increase it each time 
is just under the step of what would really be noticeable to the kid. Okay. So you figure out, you make a guess, an educated guess as to what's going to be noticeable, and make the kid mad, okay. and you do a little bit less than that. Now, when you read the actual study, does it detail the 30 steps that you went through in the study? I'm not sure that it has all 30 steps, but it probably says something like contact the author for all 30 steps, okay. and all you do is email us, and we send you all 30 all right. steps. I'm contacting you. <laughs> so um, so what, how do you make the leap from you're getting closer and closer to getting in the mouth? And then um, how do you make the leap to brushing? Yeah, again, I forget the exact steps that they came up okay. with, but um, it's some, in fact, I think it was my wife that originally came up with these steps. Okay. Uh, according to Tarbox. Um, and she designed so I'm the protocol. So I'm contacting her. You can do that. <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, we have all the steps. I'll okay. give them to you. I just can't okay. remember all of them. But it was probably something like this, like tolerate the toothbrush right here for a second, uh -huh. then maybe two seconds, then maybe open your mouth when the toothbrush is right here. Okay. And then once they do that, then maybe tolerate the toothbrush in between the lips for two seconds okay. or something, you know, like that. Yes. Like literally so gradual that the kid, it's just stupid, basically. Yeah. It yeah. seems stupid in the moment. Right, except it worked and it, it got it done. It works, you know, and, and each step is a small piece of progress, but they accumulate. And by the end, literally the kid's laughing, sometimes even requesting toothbrushing. Why? Because he gets reinforcement, okay. right? So you use a big reinforcer. Give me an example fun. of one of the reinforcers that you did with the kid that was a big re I know reinforcement is very yeah, personal, it's, and I'm, I'm putting you on the spot because sure. it's a while ago. Well, and, and each kid's different, right? right? So there was nothing standard, but what it would be, like if I was going to do this, I'd ask the mom, look, what's the one thing that he's just dying for and that you maybe is even a little too much, right? right. So a lot of moms are going to report, well, probably like, you know, the iPad or Minecraft or yes. something like that, yeah. you know? Yeah. So you say, okay, fine how about this while we're running this don't give it to them any other time except when we're teaching toothbrushing okay okay um, or or you know you could be more reasonable like limit ex you know limit the amount of this reinforcement that he gets to no more than 30 minutes a day okay for the duration of time that we're working on toothbrushing so the only way he can really get the one thing that he really really wants is for is for progress is for trying hard on this particular lesson okay and of course you're not going to limit things that are necessary for health like you're not going to limit going to the bathroom you're not going to limit right. food clothing you know right. th things like that but you, it is your right to limit junk food right, right. so you Absolutely. could say the only way he's going to earn his very favorite junk food is for this okay um, or whatever thinking about Jem what he wants more than anything else is a microphone to be able to use on his video games mm -hmm. and and we've said it's not happening Mm -hmm. uh, but that's like the thing that he would do anything for. So if I okay. said to him, you can, if you do this, uh -huh. you can have 15 minutes of micro microphone time sure. a day. That sure. would work. It's a little yeah. bit delayed. It depends, it depends on your, uh, it depends on the child's verbal capabilities too, to right. talk about and understand the future. Uh, but if your child's verbal enough, you could even make a chart that has 30 steps, yeah. like from smallest to largest. It could be a visual chart. And every time he masters, the, let's say it's a 30-step procedure, right? right? Every time he masters a new step, you color in the new step. You say, that's amazing, great job. The next day, let's work on the next step. If he masters it, color that in. And when you get step 30 mastered, we're going to go buy you the microphone. We'll take you to okay. Best Buy immediately, so buy the microphone. that's what I do. Well, no, it just depends, right? So, Only yeah. if your child has the verbal capabilities to talk about the future like that and understand it. But he you does. still want to give some intermediate reinforcement, too. Like, okay. you know what? Here's 10 minutes extra of TV time. Or okay. let's, ju let's just take 10 minutes out of our night and not do any work or bills or cooking or anything else and okay. just have fun for 10 minutes, whatever okay. it is. You're going to need some reinforcers in the moment, too, but okay. it's great to have a longer-term goal, too. Okay. Let's say, but this same protocol is going to work for a kid who's non-vocal and has no ability to talk about rules or right. contingencies of the future. It's going to work fine because the reason why it works is graduated exposure right. to the thing he's scared of right. and positive reinforcement. And you okay. don't need language for either of those processes to work. Right. Fascinating. See, this is the kind of stuff that they talk about at ABAI that will explode your head because it's these day-to-day -day things that seem like not a big deal, like you would never pack your car and go to a conference to figure out how to brush your kid's teeth, but when you right. get there right. and you learn it and go, okay, I wouldn't have thought of it that way, and it has the potential to change your whole day. And you know, we talk about short-term benefit versus long-term benefit. Yeah. The short-term benefit of doing a really slow fading procedure like this, you know, with the steps that are so small they seem ridiculous. The short-term benefit seems absurd. It seems like, are you joking? I don't care if my kid can look at a toothbrush for one second, right? right. Short-term benefit seems absurd. But the long-term benefit is almost impossible to measure. Like you said, you yeah. can work on a problem. You can literally get angry about a problem every day. Yeah. 
for years of your life, yes. right? By yes. doing the same old thing, or you can do a new procedure that is angering in the moment, but could right. save you years of frustration yeah. if you just really do well, it. Well, not only that, I mean, you know, think about the, the uh, you know, we have a friend who just recently had to take her child to get dental work, and it's going to be five works, weeks of dental work, thousands of dollars, right. and the kid traumatized right. every single time they go, and right. traumatized when they leave. And Right, and you can bet it's not going to teach them to like the dentist, because they're not no. going to do it slowly, they're not going to do it with reinforcement, they're just going to do what they do, you know, right. they might restrain them, they might put them under, uh, you know, just knock them out oh, under, under general yeah. anesthesia, whatever it is, but it's not going to be fun. Unpleasant. Now, the same research group, uh, Amy uh, Kenzer and Michelle Wallace are um, in our Phoenix office, have also been doing other dental procedures too. So okay. we haven't published anything on that quite yet, but they've taught kids to tolerate um, flossing, tolerate say. mirror in the mouth, tolerate uh -huh. x-rays, tolerate wow. basically everything, uh, having their teeth cleaned. Um, wow. And it's all the same basic procedure. Break it down to baby steps. Don't force the kid to yeah. do it. Let it. Give them a break when they want a break, but also use huge positive reinforcers. Awesome. Really great. I think we should take a break and we'll come back. We have some questions that we'll hopefully get to. And I want to hear some more about other things that they talked about because that was life changing. I'm realizing that I just need to get a lot more patient because already I want to skip ahead. I want to jump 15 steps right, in right, my head. Right. And then I'm saying to myself, why are you reinventing the wheel that they just created that works? Right. Shannon. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, we're going to take a break and come back more with Dr. Tarbox after these messages. The Institute for Behavioral Training provides programs to educate students, parents, and professionals proven techniques using applied behavior analysis. Access online video lessons with IBT eLearning. Get one-on-one -on -one personalized instruction with IBT face-to-face -face training. Acquire professional guidance with IBT BCBA supervision. Develop professional growth with IBT continuing education courses. Get access to IBT services today. IBT, 360 degrees of ABA training. Skills is an online program that provides assessment, curriculum, positive behavior support planning for challenging behavior, and progress tracking, and it does this all in one place. The skills assessment and curriculum addresses eight areas of development, which even includes advanced higher level areas such as executive functions and cognition, which pretty much makes skills the only ABA-based set of curricula for teaching more complex skills, things like problem solving, planning, self-management, perspective taking, and even inferring and predicting others' private events. Skills is a four-step system. Step one is to add the child to your account. Step two is to start assessment. The skills assessment is the only ABA-based assessment with psychometric research demonstrating the language subscale to have excellent reliability. Every area of human functioning and typical child development from infancy to adolescence was researched, making the skills assessment the most comprehensive of its kind in the world, and we're quite proud of that. Skills is easy to use. Simply click Start Assessment and begin answering questions. Or simply type in a keyword, find specific activities to assess, and add activities to treatment. Step 3. Choose activities. Once you've completed the assessment, Skills selects from a pool of 4,000 activities categorized by age, level, and skill type to provide you with exactly those activities each child needs. Start by choosing a curriculum, then a lesson, and finally an activity. Click the information icon to view prerequisites, ages in which targets develop, examples, and IEP goals. Click the video icon to watch a short video. Once you've identified an activity you want to teach, adding activities to treatment is a snap. Step 4. Start treatment. Here you can access customizable activity lesson details, add your own customized targets and exemplars, and edit an activity status such as introducing or mastering it. You can even print handouts such as worksheets, tracking forms, visual aids, and other materials. Skills also offers multiple progress charts, mapping curriculum progress, lesson progress, and cumulative number of activities and targets mastered over time. The skills language curriculum is categorized by verbal behavior type so that users can identify progress for verbal operants, such as echoics, mans, 
tax, and interverbals. Skills is one of the only programs that provides the ability to write behavior intervention plans, or BIPs, for challenging behavior. With just a few clicks, the outline of the behavior intervention plan is written for you and ready to be printed and implemented. You can learn more about Skills today and get started by visiting us at www.skillsforautism.com or you can call us at 877-975-4559. Skills, progress starts here. Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod, and we're here with a very special guest, Dr. Jonathan Tarbox. Jonathan is the Director of Research and Development here, at the Head of Research and Development here at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders, and the Director of the Autism Research Group, a really wonderful organization that appreciates your input. If you have something that you would like to see research done on that would add to the quality of your life, please go to their website and let them know. Tell them what website they can go to. Uh, autismresearchgroup.org and we have a, a parent generated research initiative where we're, there's a, a interview or a, a survey basically to fill mm -hmm. out to express your opinion about what you think matters in autism research. Great. And I, I just really quickly, we had a question that came in because uh, I've, I've mentioned several times on the show that today is my son's IEP. It's always a one of those moments in my life. Congratulations. Uh, it is, you know, and, and quite honestly, it's it's a great time now. It is an absolutely great time. It's an opportunity for me to sit down with a bunch of professionals that I know really care about my son and his progress. I still have anxiety from all the years, you know, early on, but we've had great progress and I have nothing to be anxious about. And yet I am. Uh, just keeping it real, right? Sharing. Uh, but somebody wrote it and said, Shannon, I've been spring cleaning. Do I need to keep old IEP documents? You know, you get so much paperwork from them. And I would suggest, you know, one of the things that Autism Speaks puts uh, on their 100-day kit list of things to get or to ask for um, when people are asking you, what can we do to help, is to get a scanner so that you don't have all the paperwork, but that you have them, them someplace. You may need to refer back to something. I wouldn't keep all the periphery paper. Like, they always give you your rights, which is a big, thick thing. You know, get rid of those because they change from time to time, and they'll always give you another one um, if you need them. And uh, in the IEP, sometimes, I mean, we've had IEPs that have been 52 pages long. Um, but if there's one per year, that doesn't take up a whole lot of file space. But if you were to scan it and then have it, uh, and then just make sure you make a backup copy that you keep like in a bank deposit or whatever, I think it's a good idea to have them. You never know when you're going to want to have to re refer back and say, hey, we haven't had progress. We've had this goal for how many years or whatever. So I would keep them, but if it's great to go paperless. I'm, I'm trying to get there in my life because the paper for autism is you bury you, uh, the forest that they've taken down just to in generate the paperwork for autism parents is it's disgusting. Um, and so I applaud you for the spring cleaning. If you could rub some of that off on me, I would greatly appreciate you. All right, I digress. But we also had another question. And by the way, somebody else wrote in and said, uh, we were talking about play dates with Dr. Nadowski. Uh, they said, I do play dates galore. I'm still praying someone will reciprocate and let my son play at a friend's house. That is one of those things that hurts a mom's feelings. Now, you can come to my house, <laughs> but I have to be honest with you. I am, my problem is that I ask kids to come over for play dates and then they want to reciprocate and I don't want to. And it's not that my son doesn't want to. I don't want to. I just don't want to. It's outside my comfort zone. So you can come to my house and we'll have worked that all out. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be just perfect. I'll be happy to have your child play at my house. And then it, it, as long as you're okay with the fact that I'm never going to bring my child to your house. Isn't it funny how we all are? But bless your heart. Um, you know, I would bet you more than anything, it's about their stuff and not your child. People don't like to have people over for play date because then they have to clean their house. Or they have the child comment on how they don't have the stuff that they have or what People get uncomfortable. So don't take it personally is uh, what I'm going to suggest, although it's impossible to not. Uh, but come to my house. <laughs> Send me an email. Next time you're in California because you're going to come to Disneyland, you can come to my house. We'll have a play date to end all play dates. Okay. 
Um, moving on, we had a question that came in this morning, uh, Dr. Tarbox. It's a lengthy question. Uh, I have a 32-month-old boy who recently received a PDD NOS diagnosis in Massachusetts. He's been responding well to his modified ABA. Now, I don't know what that is. Uh, modified ABA in the past few weeks. As he will be graduating from the state's EI program this fall, we are seeking alternative ways to continue his services. I was excited to see on the card website the Boston location is coming soon, very soon. Uh, I'm very interested in finding out more information about it. Also, I'm wondering if a biomedical approach would be a good fit for my son. My son has been very healthy since birth, no fever, no cold, no issues with sleeping, eating, asthma, allergy, and no signs of developmental regressions so far. I do, however, see some noticeable veins on his left side of his face, under his eye, and across his lower cheek. Do you re recommend that I take him to a biomedical professional, and if so, where do I start? Uh, and I thank you for including your name, which we're not going to include in that. Um, but um, so let's let's take on the first part of the question, 32-month-old boy, um, going to age out of their early intervention, and what would you recommend? Well, <clears throat> if he still has clinically significant deficits and he still has areas uh, in language, communication, social skills, etc., uh, uh, independent living skills um, that he needs to catch up on, he should not be aging out of treatment. That's not the right course of action. He needs to stay in a top quality ABA program um, for at least, I would say, at least another year or two, depending. You know, as long as he's still showing that there's areas of need, uh, areas of skill deficit, there's no reason for him not to be in an ABA program. I mean, the, the research is clear on that, that if you're under the age of four or so, you should be getting 30 to 40 hours a week for yeah. two or more years. So really, kids shouldn't be aging out of these programs as long as they still have deficits, right? If they're done, if, they're, if there's nothing left to teach yeah. and they're caught up with their typically developing peers, great, kick them out of the ABA program. We're done. I think but part of it... Part, excuse me for one second. Part of the issue is that the funding sources come from different places. So right. you get to a certain age, and no matter how you are, you're funding from that right. source. Even in California, that's not the early intervention to accept, though. I mean, that yes, may be the exactly. case for one particular funding source. But right. Massachusetts um, is actually fair, fairly forward-thinking in terms yeah. of public school districts funding ABA programs. So that yeah. I know that a lot of families that live in the Boston area, um, their a full-time, uh, full-day ABA program is funded by their public school district. There you go. Uh, in fact, the school district even pays for a cab to take the kid to the center. So, you wow. know, that's, you know, it's uh, the, uh, Massachusetts is fairly good compared to okay. most states. Yeah. In addition, I believe they have medical insurance com coming yes, online they there. Do. Maybe if it hasn't already started, it's going to start really soon. Yes. So, um, it's not just because your child is aging out of the early intervention period. That is not a reason to accept that he or she no longer uh, has a right to effective treatment. Yeah. It's still there. You're going to have to shift your programs. And it looks like they, they know that in our are trying to figure out what, and they have an interest in the card office in Boston. I believe has their 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 opening. Sometimes I think it's the twenty the twenty something of June. Okay. I, for some reason, the twenty first of June sticks in my head. It might be the twenty seventh. Um, but so it's very soon, and I would say, you know, if they're opening doors, then that they're probably uh, taking calls from clients absolutely. even now. Yeah, absolutely. So the and, thing to do, I think, would be to call the regular card one eight hundred number. Yes. And then they will route the information to the Boston people. Absolutely. And and you, you we all know that there's a process in terms of getting your funding sources and stuff. And and so even though the office may not actually be opening and seeing kids for a couple of more weeks, now's a great time to be calling and getting oh, yeah. them because you it's not the people in that office. Beforehand. It's yeah. the people in, in the building that we're in that will deal with the contracts with your insurance company and all of that. So now is the ideal time to be talking with them about that. As a parent I can tell you that there are a lot of ABA programs out there, and I've had the opportunity to, and there are wonderful ABA programs. Absolutely. Um, and, and that that's a very exciting thing. I personally experienced the CARD experience, and I have met many other parents who have done many other kinds of ABA, and I would tell you, if you can have CARD, have CARD. Don't don't second guess if that's just, you know, me parent to parent. If you can do that, sure. make that and, happen. And, you know, the reality is shop around, you know, go interview sure. multiple different programs. Why not see which one seems like the best fit for you? I mean, you know. and that's very sweet of you to say. And I, but I'm going to say who has time for that? If well, you know that true. something <laughs> is good. Yeah. Um, and I don't you know, there are a lot of other providers that I'm not sure. And in that case, I would tell you to shop around. But if right. you have the opportunity to go and be with card, I know that you're going to get a quality of service. That's right. 
that I saw in my home. And, um, but it's sweet of you to say shop around. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, you know, because with CARD, you not only, uh, you get all the research that, that has been done over 20 years and the curriculum that's been on over 20 years, but you, I think you also get a level of training that's done that I, 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 I have not heard from another parent um, across the board, that kind of level yeah, of treatment. Our, yeah, our training is pretty much second to none. So yeah, so, and the curriculum is second to none in my that's opinion. Right. So, and the research is unbelievable the amount of research you. that you guys do I am I am impressed with you uh, <laughs> I think that's evident every week that we're here but in any case I, so I would pursue that now as far as the biomedical sure. um, as somebody who has seen a lot of children you are not a, a biomedical doctor you're not a medical doctor right I'm a seen, behavior doctor right so I'm, I'm not an expert in uh, you know medical treatment or physiology or biology or any of that um, and, but I am a scientist, trained scientist, yeah. I'm a professional scientist. Um, so really the only recommendation that I ever give is, you know, make sure that the treatments that you're getting your child um, for anything, not just autism, but anything else, are based on research and that there's real good quality scientific evidence, not just testimonials, yeah. um, that the treatment's going to work. Um, and so I would say if your child has any signs of being sick, absolutely get him to the doctor. Yeah. But that has nothing to do with autism. That has to do with right. maybe your kid's sick. Right. If there's no signs of your child being ill in any way, why go to the doctor? Yeah. Um, a lot of a lot of times within the autism community, it's just sort of an, an, an automatic default, like, well, I got to take my kid to the doctor because he has autism, right. and see what types of biomedical treatments to do. And that's an option. That's a common approach. Right. Um, but there isn't any scientific evidence that doing that is going to produce any better outcomes for your child. Yeah. There's about four to five hundred different treatments for autism. The last time anyone counted, probably ninety nine ninety eight percent of those don't have one single study supporting that they work. Right. It's actually showing, look, we did this treatment with this kid and the kid's doing better because of that. Yeah. So Yeah. And I and I think there's a, a lot of opportunity to spin your wheels and worry about am I not doing enough? That that's that's for a sure. that's a big deal in our community and it's something that we all have to, you know, keep on top of. Uh, you know, you describe a child who sounds incredibly healthy, but you also describe a concern that you have with a vein right. in their face. And I think any time, you know, again, just speaking parent to parent, um, you know, what I get from that is that you have a concern. And I would say honor your feelings of concern about that and get that checked. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think it's pretty much the same sure. thing that you said. Can't hurt and then. Checked. And then, you know, in terms of having curiosity about what is out there biomedically, uh, the, the place that I would refer you uh, over any other is to go to TACA, TACANow.org. What you'll do is get hooked up with a support group of parents. That's exactly what TACA is, a support group of parents that talk about everything autism. And so you will have the opportunity to talk with parents about what kinds of things they're doing and why they did them. And you you might even have the opportunity to talk to a group of parents who also have children who have, you know, veins that are visible in their child's face. My son has a visible vein in uh, in his nose, and I'm told that it's just the most common thing. But I had great concern about it. Seems like it must be something but, wrong with it. Yeah. But it was but it was uh, across, and it's still there. And some days it's more visible than others. But you know, I needed to get it checked. I needed to get it checked. And and you might find other parents. Parents that you know have seen that oh, there there was a concern about it that was an actual concern. So I, I encourage you to hook up with a parent support group like Taka. They'll be useful to you in ways you can't even imagine in this moment in time. And I would say, as a scientist, while you do that, because I certainly would encourage that, uh -huh. while you do that, keep in mind that human beings want to find things that work. Yes. It's our natural tendency yes. to want to observe. Well, no, it's our natural tendency to observe what we want to be real. We can't help it. That's why science exists, actually. Yeah. It's because all human beings do this. Um, so if you go anywhere to any disorder on the planet and you ask a group of people, what did you do and what worked? Yeah. A lot of people will report that they did stuff and they truly believe that it worked and it didn't work. It didn't do anything. Okay. And that's just what we do as human beings. We can't help it. Okay. And it's not specific to autism. It's you could we could right. be talking about car maintenance. We could be talking about anything. There's beliefs that we have in our culture that we cling to because they seem right. They seem yeah. intuitive. Um, and if enough people start to say something, we start to believe that it's right. true. 
um, when in fact maybe it isn't. I mean, we saw that with our hyperbaric oxygen study. We really believed that that would help. I and mean, we, we want we did the study because we wanted to help kids and we wanted to find something that might help. And what we found was the parents in the hyperbaric oxygen group, because we did a, a randomized between groups designed study with a, uh, an HBOT group and a placebo group where the right. parents thought their kids were getting HBOT, but they weren't. Right. The parents in the HBOT group reported that their kids did a lot better. And we were actually really excited by those findings. And then right. we analyzed the same data from the place placebo group. Right. And the parents in the placebo group thought their kids were doing a lot better. And yeah. a lot of them requested you know, can we continue the HBOT that we're right, getting? And it's not like we were trying to trick anybody, but that's right. how you do medical research is placebo groups. Turns out they weren't getting, they weren't getting it. Right. And, but they still had a belief this must be working. It must be yeah. because apparent people are going to see that, you know, anything that your child does, that's, that's an improvement, that's magical. You're going to see it and, and it's going to be incredible and you're going to be happy about it. And yeah. you're going to want to believe that, it's because of X, Y, and Z. And yeah, I want to I want to just like go back and fill in a couple of things for people who were just tuning in and hearing about this study. First of all, it was a soft shell chamber. Right. I want to make yep. sure that we make that clear because we've talked about this before on the show. Second of all, for the for those of you who are like, what? There were kids. There were parents who thought they were getting the treatment and right. they weren't it getting like the we're treatment. Tricking people or they right? they absolutely signed a, a release saying that they knew that that was a potential, and then at the sure. end they were offered. They actually did get. The they were offered the treatment, yeah, so right. nobody was Afterwards. like. It wasn't like they were dang dangling candy. It was all very on the up and up, and everybody right. was treated very nicely and fairly. Right. Just want to make sure so that people don't write and go, "You horrible people." <laughs> they were very, <laughs> they were very sweet. My child was one of the children who was offered uh, the the treatment, uh, being a part of the study. So it was all very professionally done. Uh, okay, we have to take a break. But as we go to break, uh, somebody had written in and said, "Thanks, Shannon, about the IEP suggestion. Reading over the years of IEPs is so depressing. The way each teacher therapist goes." on and on about all his weaknesses is all much almost too much for a mom to take and yes that is one of those things that it's a great reason to have them in a file cabinet someplace away that you only go to and look at or that they're on the computer disk or they're on the computer because that is that is a, not a neighborhood you go in by yourself that will depress anyone you are right on target there I, a, any of us would be depressed by that but remember that that's not where you are right now that your child has made progress and um, that there there is more progress available to your child and one person's opinion of where your child is starting is not where your child's going to end up. We've seen that time and time again. That's right. Would you not say? Uh, absolutely. And every child with autism is capable of learning. Absolutely. Every single and one, making progress. no matter what age, is capable of making yeah. progress. And and we can, you know, it is a thing, a mom thing, that we can get into that mode of, uh, you know, and I go there on a regular basis and I remind myself, that is in the past. That is not helping me to be the effective, efficient person, part of the team, to create that progress. So you, you visit it when you have to, and then you pick yourself up and say, what can I do right now? Well, is there a phone call that you need to make for uh, for something that's that's happening that you need to do, or is is there some opportunity, teaching opportunity that you're missing right now because of those stinking, smelly IEP papers that are of no fun to you? Uh, avoid and, them. And or can I just go have 30 minutes of harmless enjoyment with my kid? Yes. You know, where it's not maybe we're not even doing anything therapeutic yep. or making any progress. We're just having fun Bonding. and enjoying life together. Absolutely, it couldn't be better said. And I would say to you, if your child is at school, can I go take 10 minutes by myself, refresh myself and think about all the things that I have to be grateful for so that when my child comes back, I'm ready to have that moment with them. Uh, a much better use of the time. It is one of those things that, and that's why, you know, you have a support group for another parent to say, don't go there, don't go there, uh, or, and don't go there by yourself, <laughs> right? We're going to take a short break and come back to, to finish out the show. Stick with us. Autism used to affect one in every 10,000 children. Now it affects one in every 91 kids. Talka is one of five organizations helping families living with autism today. Our kids came back to life. There's a whole community out there, and now we're a part of it. Oh, Taka has a place for me. To find Taka, go to www.takanow.org. Please. Welcome back to Autism Live. You just saw a commercial for Taka, and we are going this weekend to their Taka family picnic. I've never gone to one before. It's a huge, huge event. They have rides. 
It's crazy. It's fantastic. It I haven't gone either. Where is it this it's, year? It's it, in um, Orange County? Anaheim. Yeah. yeah, in Anaheim. So it should be very exciting. We'll bring back some film from that. And tomorrow, the team is going, not I, but the rest of the team, they're going to film Surfers Healing, uh, Izzy Paskowitz's group that they take professional surfers and they take kids with autism out on a surfboard. Cool. Usually for it's like a 20 to 20 minute to half hour period for each kid. It's the most amazing thing. My son did it once. It's I, you, I would someday we have to put it up on YouTube. We were so excited. He was five, and so we took him out of kindergarten to take him to go and do it. And I'm so you 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 know me a little bit. I'm so overly cautious about everything my child does. Uh, you know, over the top cautious. And so I walk him to the ocean and I have him in a wetsuit that they had him put on. And we're standing there waiting for our turn. And two huge men who I've never met before, don't know what their names are or were, came and took my child and walked into the ocean and I was going wait wait I want to get the kid who are you and they just walked my child into the ocean and there are all these surfers out there with these little heads and I can't tell which one is my child's head and so I have the video camera and I lost him in the first instant, I didn't get to see any of it. And so the footage from the video camera is just a crazy woman panning back and forth across, across the ocean <laughs> with a monologue running the whole time going, why did I do that? Why did I just, like, two strangers take my child, speaking out loud? It's hilarious and tragic at the same time. And did, did he have a smile when he came back? <laughs> he came. He had a smile the size of the moon when he came back, and he really hadn't been making a whole lot of full sentences on his own, and he came back and he said, Mommy, I not die. The sharks not get me. Oh. And, and I just, and he was freezing. You know, it's very cold yeah. uh, in the ocean, and, 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 and so he was just shaking, and I held him, and I was like, Honey, I had no idea that he was worried about that. Yeah. Like, I had no idea idea that he had enough going on right. that he knew that there were sharks out there and that he must have been terrified and I didn't know because he didn't have the words to tell me and they just dragged him into the I, well we haven't done it since because I keep asking <laughs> him now and he has the words to say to me I prefer not to do that <laughs> no thanks <laughs> it was very but fun still, and I'm glad I did it once what an amazing step though what an amazing adventure yeah. for him to, to and, do that once and I have always felt that you know part of the reason why the words came that was because it was such an amazing thing for him. Uh, and I have a picture of him going into the ocean and a picture of him coming back, and I have w crazy woman footage in between. <laughs> uh, oh, well, what are you going to do? Uh, okay, so we had somebody who wrote it and said, my child is seven years old, and we can't get him uh, to potty in the commode. Uh, how do I get him to go potty not in his pants? Okay, so... Hopefully they're talking number one because number one's a lot easier than number two. So I'll address number one real quick. Okay. Um, real, you know, just proven methods. It's it, it's not rocket science. It doesn't matter. It doesn't like we always say. Well, it depends on the child. This and that. This doesn't yeah. really depend too much on the child. This okay. basic thing I'm going to tell you works probably 99% of the time. Take him out of diapers. Take him to the toilet. Have him sit on the toilet frequently. Um, at first, maybe every 10 or 15 minutes. Have him drink lots of fluids and then have enormous positive reinforcers if he even gets one drop of urine in the toilet. Yeah. That's it. And then you gradually increase the amount of time in between potty trips if he is peeing in the toilet and yeah. not peeing in his pants. I mean, yeah. that basic system works for pretty much everybody. I've used that system yeah. with... Um, 50-year-old adults who yeah. with profound intellectual disabilities that have never spent one minute of their life toilet trained, and yeah. it works. Yeah. So it's just a real simple thing. Positive reinforcement works. You uh, take them to the toilet frequently so that you can catch the behavior happening where right. it should happen, right? right? You take the diapers off because then that gives the child immediate feedback when they pee on themselves in their pants. You can feel it. When you pee in a diaper, it absorbs the urine immediately, and yeah. so you can't feel it. Especially so it gives, today's diapers. They, they work really well, right? Yeah. Uh, and so uh, it gives the child immediate feedback. Oops, I had an accident. Yeah. You don't have to make it negative, no punishment, you don't have to do overcorrection That's or any important. of that stuff. Yeah. Make it positive. Put the kids' favorite posters and favorite cartoon characters in the bathroom so that the bathroom is a fun place to be. Turn on some music. Um, but frequent trips to the bathroom, take off the diapers, huge positive reinforcement as soon as the child pees in the toilet, and then gradually increase the amount of time between bathroom trips. Okay. Slowly. 
But I want to go back to what you said about don't make a big deal. So if they, when they have, and they will have accidents, sure. let's not think that you're going to do this and they're just going to get it right. Yeah. You know, first day, no, no must, no fuss. They are going to have accidents and we don't discuss it. We just take the clothes off and put the other stuff on. You know, there's no punishment There's a, there's a couple it. different ways to do it. You could say, oops, you had an accident. Okay, but you no know. big. Why are we doing this? You've been told to do, no. you know, nothing big that comes with it. There's no other punishment for right. it. We just change and we don't make them sit in the soiled pants. Right, right. And there um, are other procedures where if this doesn't work, there are other procedures where you can have the child practice taking their pants on and off a few times or cleaning up the mess or stuff like that. But right. that's, it's, that's not necessary at first. Right. Frequent trips to the bathroom, huge positive reinforcement, make it positive. Okay. And give, give your child lots of fluids because what does that do? Yes. That makes them have to pee more, right? So that right. increases the probability that they're going to have to just accidentally go pee when you happen to be sitting on the toilet. Right. Now, what we usually do is do this, um, like starting Friday night or Saturday morning and call it a potty party. Basically the whole weekend is just about toilet training. So you can right. kiss off anything else you're going to do that weekend. <laughs> right. But honestly, with most kids that we do this with and seven years old is fine. That's not too old or right. too young or anything else. Most of the kids that we do this with by Monday, they're having very few accidents and they're having lots of success on the toilet. Okay. And they're feeling proud of themselves. They want to know what if you have younger siblings that want to potty at the same time, twins. Um, great. Maybe a potty chair. Get an extra potty chair to put yeah. in the bathroom or something. Yeah, um, then then it should be really reinforcing. Yeah, right? I mean, yeah, then it really take, is a potty party. Yeah, I would take advantage of anything you can do to make the whole situation more fun, yeah. less scary, more positively reinforcing. If the kids want to do it at the same time, great. They can high five each other. It can be a team effort. Yeah. you know, nothing wrong with yeah, that. Yeah, and we see that sometimes if one peer does something, it's less scary to you know. Right. Okay. And, and the thing is, don't force them. You know, a lot of kids yeah. are afraid of the bathroom. They're afraid to sit on the toilet. You don't need to force it. If you're using big, big enough positive enforcers and you're not making a huge deal out of it you should be able to basically bribe them into sitting on the toilet long yeah. enough to be successful and then get reinforcement there you go uh, we're pretty much out of time and I have a couple of programming notes for you here uh, we're not here on Monday and Tuesday of next week because my child is turning 10 and so I will be at Disneyland you can look for me there Good for you. Uh, feel free to text me or Facebook me or tweet me there um, we'll be back on Wednesday uh, with Dr. Doreen Grampache answering your questions so I'm just going to remind you now that over the weekend you can send questions in for Dr. Grampache that will be on Wednesday and then we will be here for Thursday and Friday, and hopefully we'll have an opportunity to have you back on Friday as Friday. well. Yep. So all of that really exciting, but then um, I'm trying to think if it's then the following week. I'm confused about my weeks. I am taking off a great deal of time in uh, in June, but we will have we will have some reruns for you here to show. And in the meantime, over the weekend, I hope you will remember to look at our Facebook, help us out, help the families out in the state of California here by following the link on our Facebook and either calling or texting or sending an email to the representatives that are there and, and telling them to not pass this new law that would make it so regional centers cannot fund copay and deductible. This is to the detriment of so many people, uh, so please help us out there. Dr. Uh, Tarbox, thank you so much for being here. Happy I will see you guys on Wednesday when I have a 10-year-old child. So until then, give your kiddos a hug from me. Bye-bye for now.